Imagine that you were going to take a long trip across the country. The first thing you would do would be to choose your destination and then get a road map to determine the very best way to get there. Each day before you started out, you would locate yourself on a map relative to where you are and where you plan to go in the hours ahead. Life is very much the same. Once you have decided upon your values, vision, mission, purpose, and goals, the next step is for you to analyze your starting point. Exactly where are you today, and how are you doing in each of the important areas of your life, especially as they relate to your goals? Jack Welch, CEO of General Electric for many years, once said that the most important quality of leadership is the reality principle. He defined this as the ability to see the world as it really is, not as you wish it were. You would begin every meeting to discuss a goal or a problem with the question, what's the reality? Peter Drucker refers to this quality as intellectual honesty, dealing with the facts exactly as they are before attempting to solve a problem or make a decision. Abraham Maslow once wrote that the first quality of the self-actualizing person was the ability to be completely honest and objective with himself or herself. It is the same with you. If you want to be the best you can be and to achieve what is truly possible for you, you must be brutally honest with yourself and your point of departure. You must sit down and analyze yourself in detail to decide exactly where you are today in each area. For example, if you decided to lose weight, the very first thing you would do is to weigh yourself to determine how much you weigh today. From then on, you continually use that weight as your measure for whether or not you are making progress in weight reduction. If you decide to begin a personal exercise program, the first thing you do is to determine how much you are exercising today. How many minutes per day and per week are you exercising, and how intensely each time? What kind of exercises are you doing? Whatever your answer, it is important that you be as accurate as you possibly can. You then use this answer as a starting point and make your exercise plans for the future based on it. If you want to earn more money, the first thing you do is sit down and determine exactly how much you are earning right now. How much did you earn last year and the year before? How much will you earn this year? How much are you earning each month? The best measure of all is for you to determine how much you are earning each hour right now. You can determine your hourly rate by dividing your annual income by 2000, the approximate number of hours that you work each year. Even better, you can divide your monthly income by 172, the number of hours you work on average each month. Many of my coaching clients calculate their hourly rate each week and compare it against previous weeks. They then set a goal to increase the value of what they do each hour so as to increase the amount they earn each hour on a go-forward basis. You should do the same. The tighter and more accurate your calculations regarding your income or any other area, the better and faster you can improve in each one of them. For example, the average person thinks in terms of monthly and annual salary. This is hard to analyze and increase. Conversely, the high performer thinks in terms of an hourly rate, which is amenable to improvements on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Since you are the president of your own personal services corporation, you should view yourself as being on your own payroll. Imagine you are paying yourself by the hour. Be just as demanding on yourself as you would be on someone else who is working for you. Refuse to do anything that doesn't pay your desired hourly rate. If you have set a long-term financial goal, the next step is for you to determine exactly how much you are worth today in financial terms. If your goal is to become a millionaire in the years ahead, you must calculate exactly how much you have accumulated as of today's date. Most people are confused or dishonest about this calculation. Your true dollar net worth is the amount that you would have left over if you sold everything you own today at what the market would pay and then paid off all your bills prior to leaving the country. Many people place a high value on their personal possessions. They think that their clothes, cars, furniture, and electronics are worth a lot of money. But the true value of these items is usually not more than 10% or 20% of what you pay, and sometimes less. For accurate financial planning, calculate your net worth today and then draw a line from that point to your long-term financial goal. Divide the line by the number of years you intend to spend to achieve that financial goal. In this way, you will know exactly how much you have to save, invest, and accumulate each year in order to become financially independent. Is your goal realistic based on where you are today and the time that you have allocated to get to where you want to go? If your goal is not realistic, force yourself to be completely honest and revise both your calculations and your projections. When you begin to plan your long-term future, one of the most valuable exercises you can engage in is called zero-based thinking. In zero-based thinking, you ask this question, knowing what I now know is, is there anything that I am doing today that I wouldn't start up again today if I had to do it over, knowing what I now know? No matter who you are or what you are doing, there are certain things in your life that, knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get into again today if you had them to do over. It is difficult, if not impossible, for you to make progress in your life if you allow yourself to be held back by decisions you have made in the past.
If there is something in your life that you wouldn't get into again today, your next question is, how do I get out and how fast? Apply zero-based thinking to the people in your life, both business and personal. Is there any relationship in your life that, knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get into? Is there any person that you have hired, assigned, or promoted that, knowing what you now know, you wouldn't hire back again today? Is there any person that you are working with or for that, knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get involved with again today? Be perfectly honest with yourself when you ask and answer these questions. Examine every aspect of your work life and career. Is there any job that you have taken on that, knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get into? Is there any part of your business or work that, knowing what you now know, you wouldn't start up again? Is there any activity, process, product, service, or expenditure in your business that, knowing what you now know, you wouldn't embark upon again today if you had to do it over? After people and work considerations, look at your investments. Is there any investment of time, money, or emotion that, knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get into again today if you had to do it over? If the answer is no, how do you get out and how fast? I have a good friend who is a golfer in high school and university. As a bachelor, he played golf several times a week. He organized his entire life around golf, even flying south in the winter to golf courses that had no snow on them. Over time, he started and built a business, got married, and had children, but he was still locked into the idea of playing golf several times a week. Eventually, the enormous time commitment of playing golf began to affect his business, his married life, and his relationship with his children. When the stress became too great, he sat down and zero-based his activities. He realized that, knowing what he now knew in his current situation, golf would have to be cut back dramatically if he was going to achieve other things in his life that were now more important. By reducing his golfing time, he got his whole life back into balance in just a few weeks. How might this principle applies to you? What time-consuming activities should you reduce or eliminate? Fully 70% of the decisions that you make will turn out to be wrong in the fullness of time. When you made the decision or commitment, it was probably a good idea based on the circumstances of the moment. But now the situation may have changed, and it is time to zero-base it based on the way things are today. You can usually tell if you are in a zero-base thinking situation because of the stress that it causes. Whenever you are involved in something that, knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get into, you experience ongoing stress, aggravation, irritation, and anger. Sometimes people spend an enormous amount of time trying to make a business or personal relationship succeed. But if you zero-base this relationship, the correct solution is often to get out of the relationship altogether. The only real question is whether or not you have the courage to admit that you were wrong and take the necessary steps to correct the situation. If you want to earn a certain amount of money, ask yourself, why am I not earning this amount of money already? What is holding you back? What is the major reason that you are not already earning what you want to earn? Again, you must be perfectly honest with yourself. Look around you and identify people who are earning the kind of money that you want to earn. What are they doing differently from you? What special skills and abilities have they developed that you have not yet developed? What skills and abilities do you need to acquire if you want to earn the same kind of money they are earning? If you are not sure, go and ask them. Find out. This is too important for guesswork or chance. Do a skills inventory on yourself. First, identify the key result areas of your work. These are the tasks that you absolutely, positively have to fulfill in an excellent fashion in order to do your job well. What are they? In every job, there are seldom more than five to seven key result areas. These are critical tasks you must be excellent at each one of them in order to do the whole job for which you are paid. You must be good at every one of these tasks if you want to earn the kind of money that you are capable of earning. Here is an important discovery. Your weakest key skill sets the height at which you can use all your other skills. Your weakest key result area, wherever it is, determines your income in your field. You can be absolutely excellent at everything except for one key skill, and that skill will hold you back every step of the way. In what area, at which skill, are you the very best at what you do? What particular skill or combination of skills is responsible for your success in your career today? What is it that you do as well or better than anyone else? Once you have answered these questions, you then look at yourself in the mirror and ask, What are my weakest skill areas? Where are you below average or poor? What is it that you do poorly that interferes with your ability to use your other skills? What is it that you do poorly that other people do better than you? Especially what key skills do you lack that are essential for your success? Whatever they are, you need to identify them accurately and honestly and then make a plan to improve in each area. We will discuss these in depth in a later chapter. When you embark on the achievement of any great goal, you should imagine that at any time you could start your career over again. Never allow yourself to feel locked in or trapped by a particular decision from the past. Keep focused on the future. 
Many people today are walking away from their educations, their businesses, their industries, and their years of experience to get into something completely new and different. They are honest enough to recognize that there is a limited future in the direction they are going, and they are determined to get into something where the future possibilities are far greater. You must do the same. In doing a baseline assessment of yourself and your life, you must face the facts, wherever they are. As Harold Janine of ITT once said, facts don't lie. Seek out the real facts, not the obvious facts, the apparent facts, the hope for facts, or the wished for facts. The true facts are what you need to make good decisions. Take a hard look at your current company and industry. Take a hard look at your current job situation. Take a hard look at your market relative to your competitors. In reinventing yourself, stand back and think about starting your career over again today, knowing what you now know. Imagine that your job and your industry disappeared overnight. Imagine that you had to make brand new career choices. If you were starting over again today with your special combination of talents and skills, what would you choose to do that is different from what you are doing now? Your most valuable financial asset is your earning ability. It is your ability to apply your talents and skills in the marketplace to earn money. In reality, you could lose your home, your car, your bank account, and your furniture and be left with nothing but the clothes on your back. But as long as your earning ability was intact, you could walk across the street and begin generating a good living almost immediately. Your earning ability is extremely precious to you, and your earning ability can be either an appreciating asset or a depreciating asset. Your earning ability can grow in value if you continue to invest in it and develop it. It can decline in value if you begin to take it for granted and start to coast on the basis of what you have done in the past. See yourself as a bundle of resources capable of doing many different things. You have a wide variety of skills, abilities, knowledge, talents, education, and experience. There are many jobs and tasks that you could do or learn to do extremely well. Never allow yourself to get locked into a particular course of action, especially if you are not happy with the way things are going today. In mentally starting over as though you were beginning your career anew, look deeply into yourself as well. What good habits do you have that are helping you and moving you toward your goals? What bad habits have you developed that may be holding you back? What are your very best qualities of character and personality? What are your weakest qualities? What new habits and qualities do you need to develop to get the very most out of yourself? And what is your plan to begin developing them? What bad habits do you need to get rid of and replace with good habits? Jim Collins, in his best-selling business book Good to Great, says that you must be willing to ask the brutal questions of yourself and your business if you are going to identify and remove the obstacles that are preventing you from moving ahead. What are some of the brutal questions that you have to ask yourself before you launch wholeheartedly toward your goals? Whenever I do strategic planning for a company, we start off the session with four questions. First, where are we now? We gather data and information from every part of the company to develop a crystal clear picture of our starting point, especially with regard to sales, market position, and profitability. Second, we ask, where would we ideally like to be in the future? We idealize and practice future orientation. We imagine that we can make the company into anything we like in the years ahead and create a perfect vision of what the company would look like if we were successful in every respect. The third question we ask is, how do we get to where we are today? What did we do right? What would we do differently? What have been our biggest successes so far, and why did they occur? What have we failed at, and what were the reasons for it? As George Santayana wrote, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. The fourth question we ask and answer is always, what do we do now to get from where we are to where we want to go? Based on our experience, what should we be doing more of or less of? What should we start doing that we are not doing today? What should we stop doing altogether? The good news is that if we have answered the first three questions accurately, the strategic plan or blueprint comes together more easily than if we were trying to plan without being clear about where we were or how we got there. There is an old saying, well begun is half done. Doctors say accurate diagnosis is half the cure. Taking the time to honestly evaluate each part of your situation before you launch toward your goal will save you months and even years on your journey. In many cases, it will force you to reevaluate your goals in the light of superior analysis and knowledge. It will dramatically improve the speed at which you achieve your goals once you get going.
I used to belong to the 9T who couldn't be bothered, even if it was easy. Guess how many people have a library card? Wisdom of the world available to transform your life in any value you want. By the way, how much is a library card in Texas? Free. Here's what free is easy. I mean, it can't be any easier than free. Somebody says, well, would you bring it by? No. Wisdom of the world available to transform your life spiritually, socially, personally, economically, in every other way. Catch out of your rich and powerful life. And sophisticated and healthy, influential. How many people have a library card? Answer. 3%. 95-97 couldn't be bothered. I specialize in happy hour, but he um, and now readily and quickly blames the government. Blames his company, and blames policy and blames the pay scale. When you only knew, if he joined the 3%. Here's my advice to you today. Walk away from the 97%. Don't talk like they talk. Don't act like they act. Don't go where they go. Don't specialize in what they specialize in. Throw away the blame and excuses. Start your new life. You say, well, is it as simple as getting a library card and joining the 3%? And the answer is, of course, of course, that's how easy this stuff is. This is so easy. It's so simple. It's not complex. You don't need a 2,000-year-old girl. You don't need multi-track affirmations. I'm telling you, don't affirm without discipline. It's the beginning of delusion. Don't let somebody sweep you into some contrary way to nature itself. Nature says, unless you labor, the miracle of the seed and the soil and the seasons and God and all the other stuff that's available, sunshine and rain, that's not available to you by affirmation. It is only available to you by labor. So labor well. Learn well. Discipline yourself well. You can have all the treasures you want. The stuff's easy and simple. It's not ocean waves and seagulls. You don't have to move to Sedona where all the force fields come together. Let's teach our kids the simple ways to transform their health. Number one, their economics. Number two, their ability to communicate. Number three, their life and treasure and lifestyle. Number four, spirituality. Number five, and the list goes on and on. Let's not leave out any of the least of disciplines that encourage us to do the next one. To do the next one. To do the next one. First thing you know. This whole scenario for you is spinning up instead of out of control on the negative side. This is all you've got to do. It's as simple as this. It's as simple as starting, committing yourself to life change. And once you start down this road, I promise you, to join the 10% and the 3%. Guess how many people can retire from the income of their own personal resources when it comes time to retire? Answer. 5% in the most independent country in the world. 95 are dependent. 5% are independent. Take charge of your own retirement. I'm telling you, if you take charge of your own retirement through personal development and all these skills we've taught today, take charge of your own retirement. You can multiply it at least by 5, maybe by 10, maybe by 20, maybe by 100. Let the government take care of it. Some companies take care of it. You've got to divide by 5. Take charge of your own life. Take charge of your own day. Take charge of your own conversation. Take charge of your own family. Take charge of your own possibilities and learn these skills. Develop this kind of strategy. And I'm telling you, life will open up for... Join the 3%. Join the 10%. Join the 5%. In our leadership weekend, we teach. Find out what poor people read, don't read. I'm telling you, don't talk like they talk. Lend a helping hand, but don't fall into their poor philosophical scenario. Don't blame what they blame. Don't use the excuses they use. It's called the language of the poor. Switch gears, switch language, switch ideas, switch strategy. Start with the simplest of disciplines and don't be mean any of these disciplines. The smallest discipline starts the process of life change. And if you invest in this thing called discipline, you can have whatever you wish. It's called the beginning of a miracle. We all must suffer one of two pains regardless of your choice of lifestyle and what you want to do. We must all suffer one of two pains. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. And what we suggest everybody is to consider the disciplines because disciplines weigh ounces. Regrets weigh tons. You don't want to substitute discipline for regret in our opinion. That would be a poor choice. Now you can do it but some things are poor trade-offs. The old prophet said, what if you gained the whole world, but it cost you your soul? Would that be worth it? 
And with a bit of intelligence, we say, no, that doesn't seem worth it. Even if you got the whole world, if you traded your soul, that experience would be so bitter, awful, and devastating, it wouldn't be worth it. What if you got some gain by greed instead of legitimate ambition? I'm telling you, it might taste good up front, but it's going to turn bitter in the belly. Our world is and always will be a constant battle between the life of ease and its momentary rewards, and a life of discipline and its far more significant reward. The price of discipline or the price of regret. We will pay one or the other. One of my key phrases for the whole day. Disciplines work miracles. Disciplines work miracles. Number one, do what you can do. Not let neglect grab you by the throat. Don't let neglect stall you on your path toward prosperity and health. Being able to become powerful, influential, rich beyond wildest imagination. Don't neglect what you can do. If you can read, read. If you can change, change. If you can grow, grow. If you can take one step, take one step. Do not neglect to do whatever you can do at the moment. Of course, you can't run a multi-billion dollar business today. Mark couldn't either 10 years ago. Mark couldn't either five years ago. But I'm telling you today, he can do it because step by step, year by year, he took on what he could do. He didn't neglect it. He did the meetings he could do, he made the calls he could make, he read the books he could read, he took the classes he could take, and step by step, he got himself ready. I'm telling you, do not neglect to do whatever you can do because it'll work miracles of personal development first, productivity second. Now do what you can. Here's number two. Do the best you can. If it's a foggy night and you can only see 100 feet, how can you see another 100 feet? Answer. Walk the first 100 feet. Walk as far as you can see. And then you can see some more. Walk as far as you can see. And then you can see some more. So what you've picked up here, just do it as far as you can see it. And I promise you, if you'll execute as far as you can see it, you'll be able to see more. Do that, then you can see more. And finally, get in tune with doing the best you can. And you'll have the activity that will develop the disciplines that will set this sail so that you can say, it doesn't matter how the wind blows. For some people, they see discipline as sort of an ugly word. You know, they'll talk to me about discipline. But what you must understand is discipline is a most incredible creative force. Discipline builds a career. Discipline develops good health. Discipline forms the most incredible marriage. Discipline puts together a friendship that won't quit forever. Discipline develops skills that can be magnified, you know, and touch the world. Disciplines open up music. You know you can't have incredible music without discipline. In fact, we call them disciplines. We call architecture and music and playing an instrument. We call it sculpting, painting, writing, and composing. We call those disciplines. And the disciplines give us the indication that yes, it doesn't come except by discipline, but it also means that the discipline is the open door to the creative process to turn nothing into something and to turn imagination into reality. So here's what you must learn to do. Appreciate the disciplines and welcome the disciplines. What other discipline could I begin that would open up a whole new expression in my life of turning imagination into reality? Without discipline, there is no enterprise. Without discipline, there is no magnificent structure. Without discipline, there is no music. Without discipline, there is no health. You know, there is no advantage, there is no future. So discipline is all when it comes to imagination. Having something real, believing in it, yeah. The key to development is to be all that you can possibly be. I don't know what your talents are, I don't know what your skills are, but here's what I probably am right on. That you're behind on an accelerated effort toward your full development. I would suggest that. Now for some of you, I know that's probably really not true, but even as I look at my own life, because, you know, I'm tempted to procrastinate just like everybody else. But, you know, I should have written 30 books by now. I've only written four or five. You know, I should have done a lot of things, but I haven't. You know, I got distracted, and all of us have these challenges. Well, what could I become? What could I become? I had one of my dearest friends. I've lost him. He died at age 53. One day, he drank a little too much. David drank a little too much. But he did all kinds of things. He was a builder, and he was a dreamer, and he did a lot of things. But his drinking sort of kept him in a fog for years and years. 
About six years ago, he was sitting at the yacht club. Then he was in a fog. Then suddenly it occurred to him. I wonder what I could have accomplished all these years if I hadn't been in this sort of foggy state. And he said that did it. In the last six years before he died, he was free and he accomplished some incredible things that last six years. Being all that you can be and not letting habits drag you down. Not letting things sidetrack you from the full development of what you have. But capable of being. What could all your heart encompass if you really had the chance and you really had the disciplines and really got to it? What could you really become? What could you earn? How healthy could you really be? How many books could you write? How many poems could you write? So here's what I would ask of. If you feel that you're a little bit stalled wherever you are in your progress, I'm asking you to correct that. I'm asking you to see if you can't possibly be on a more accelerated track toward your possibilities and your full development. Here's what life is all out. To become all that we can possibly be. The full development of all of your potential, that's number. Number two is the wise use of all of your resources. That's what life is all about. Discipline, if there is a magic word that stands out above all the rest, this is the one. Discipline. Discipline is the bridge between thought and accomplishment. The bridge between inspiration and valuable achievement. The bridge between necessity and productivity. Remember, all good things are upstream. The passing of time takes us adrift and drifting only brings us the negative, the disastrous, the disappointment and the failure. Failure is not a cataclysmic event. It is not generally the result of one major incident, but rather a long list of accumulated little failings. Failing in life is failing to think today, failing to act today, failing to care, to strive, to climb, to learn, to keep trying day by day. If your goal requires that you write ten letters today and you write only three, you are down seven letters. If you want to make five calls and you only make one, you are down four on calls. If your plan calls for saving ten dollars today and you save none, you're down ten dollars today. Now the danger is looking at an undisciplined day and concluding that no great harm has been done. It doesn't seem like such a bad day. But add up these days to make a year and then add up those years to make a lifetime. Perhaps you can now see how repeating today's small failures can easily turn your life into a major disaster. Success, on the other hand, is just the same process in reverse. If you plan to make 10 calls and you end the day making 15, now you're up 5 calls. If you then get up a few letters and move up the savings numbers, you can see what a massive difference it could make in a year and what wealth and accomplishment awaits for a lifetime. Discipline is like a set of magic keys that unlocks all the doors of wealth. Happiness, sophistication, culture, high self-esteem, pride, joy, accomplishment, satisfaction, and success. The first key to discipline is awareness of the need for and the value of discipline, and especially the discipline to make the changes. What will it take? What must I do? And what must I do to get all I want from my life? The second key is the willingness. More than that, the eagerness to maintain your new discipline deliberately, wisely, consistently. And the third key to discipline is the commitment to master the circumstances of your daily life, to see and harness the opportunities to make something of the sun and the rain, the good as well as what comes in the guise of misfortune. Discipline does many things, but most important of all is what it does for you. It makes you feel better about yourself. Even the smallest discipline can have an incredible effect on your attitude and the good feeling you get. That surging feeling of self-worth that comes from starting a new discipline is almost as good as the feeling that comes from the accomplishment of the discipline. Second, a new discipline immediately alters your life direction. You don't change destinations immediately. That is yet to come. But you can change direction immediately and direction is very important. Third, discipline cooperates with nature. Everything strives. It is a common life function. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it can. Everything strives to become all it can possibly be, and that striving to become is what discipline is all about. Disciplining ourselves to fulfill our natural potential. To become all that we can be. And finally, discipline attracts opportunity. Opportunity is always looking for ambition and skill in action. Discipline taps the unlimited power of commitment. The human will in action. Driven by inspiration. 
enticed by desire, tempered by reason, guided by intelligence, can bring you to that high and lofty place called the good life. So start the new process. You can begin a new habit no matter how small it is. Small isn't important. Whether or not you start and whether or not you continue are all that is important. So to have a prosperous life, start a prosperity plan. To become wealthy, start a wealth plan. Remember, you don't have to be wealthy to have a wealth plan. A person with no means can have a rich plan. If you are ill, start a health plan. If you don't have energy, start an energy plan. If you don't feel good, start a feel good plan. If you're not smart, start a smart plan. If you can't, start a can plan. If you haven't, start a plan. Anyone can, even a bad person, can start hearing good messages and reading good books. Recognize that the start of the better life, the happy life, the wealthy life, is today. This is exciting. Both the process and the result can begin today. Start the new journey today. If you think of a new idea, today is the day to begin the discipline of putting that idea into action. Set this day up as a long, busy, exciting start for your new life. Get your first book for your new library today. Begin your new practice of setting goals today. Start clearing out a drawer of your new orderly disc today. Start eating an apple a day on your new health plan today. Put some money in your new investment for fortune account today. Start reading with intensity for your new wealth of mind plan today. Write a postponed letter today. Like, pick up your camera and take a picture of something to start your new treasury of photographs today. Get some momentum going on your new commitment to a better life. See how many activities you can pile on this first day. They go all out. Break away from the negative downward pull of gravity. Start the thrusters going. Prove to yourself that waiting is over, hoping is past. And that faith and action have now taken charge. It's a new day. A new beginning for your new life. With discipline, you can't believe the list of positive moves you can make on the first day of your new beginning. Here's the time to act when the idea is hot and the emotion is strong. That's the time to act. See, Mr. Ron, I'd like to have a library like yours. Say, if you feel strong about that, what you got to do is get the first book and then get the second book before the feeling passes and before the idea gets dim. Action, pronto action, median action as soon as possible because if you don't, here's what happens. We call it the law of diminishing intent. We intend to when the idea strikes us. We intend to when the emotion is high. But now if you don't translate that into action fairly soon, now the intent starts to diminish, diminish, diminish. And a month from now, it's cold, a year from now, can't be found. So act, set up a discipline when the emotions are high and the idea is strong and clear and powerful. That's the time to set up the distance. Somebody talks about good health and you're stirred, right? You need to get a book on nutrition. Get the book before the idea passes and before the emotion gets cold. Go for the book, start the library, start the library, start the process, fall on the floor, do some push-ups. Action. Got to take action. Otherwise the wisdom is wasted. Otherwise the emotion soon passes, unless you put it into a disciplined activity. Capture it. Discipline is called how to capture the emotion and how to capture the wisdom and translate it into equity. Now here's what's important about disciplines. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. Everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. Don't be naive in saying, well, this doesn't matter. I'm telling you, everything matters. There are some things that matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. We all pity the man who says, well, this is the only place I let down. Not true. Okay to take home. Every letdown affects the rest of your performance. Every letdown affects the rest. Every letdown affects the rest. This is part of the educational process on personal development. If you don't take the walk around the block, you probably won't do the apple a day. If you don't do the apple a day, you probably won't start building your library. If you don't build your library, you probably won't keep a journal. And you won't take pictures and you won't do this, you won't do wise things with your money, won't do wise things with your time, won't do wise things with your possibilities and relationships. And the first thing you know, six years of that accumulated and we say you have messed up. So the whole key to reversing that process now 
is to start picking up these disciplines. Now here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects the rest of your discipline. Every new one affects the rest. That's why action is so important. The least action is so important. Least action, the smallest action, take it. Because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return from that one action, it will inspire you to do the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. You start walking around the block. It'll inspire you to get an apple, get an apple, get an apple. It'll inspire you to get a book, get a book. It'll inspire you to get a journal, get a journal. It'll inspire you to grow, develop some skills. All disciplines affect each other. Every lack affects the rest. Every new affects the rest. Every new affects the rest. The key is to diminish the lack. Set up the new, and you've started a whole new life process. Success is not an accident. It is a skill. It is a skill. It is predictable, and it can be learned. And it can be learned by you, and it can be learned by anyone. And the sooner you learn this skill, and the sooner you become an expert in the skills of success, the sooner you achieve the great things that you were born to accomplish. Many people think that you have to be very intelligent to be successful in life. Exhaustive research shows that many self-made millionaires have only average intelligence. The reason why this helps them is because they never become impressed with how smart they are, and they're always trying to learn more. An average person with average talents and abilities and average education can outstrip the most brilliant and genius in our society. If that average person has clear focused goals without goals, you are doomed forever to work for people who do the average. Self-made millionaires work over 60 hours per week. And this is the one single factor that they all have in common. In our society, you worked eight hours per day for survival. Everything over eight hours is for success. Somewhere in America, someone becomes a millionaire every 12 minutes. Clock is running. Get ready. This could be your time. Today, more people are becoming successful faster than any other time in human history. Someone, somewhere in America, becomes a millionaire every 12 minutes. At least 80% of these millionaires are self-made. That is, they started with nothing but ambition and energy the same way most of us start. Many of them never went to college. Many of them only got average grades in school. Many of them only got average grades in school. Many self-made millionaires started with no advantages at all. Today, we know more about how to achieve great success in life than ever before. Success is as predictable as the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. Today, success is a science. It has been broken down and subdivided and anybody can achieve greater success, wealth, and happiness in life if they simply do two things. First, make a decision to be successful right now. Most people never decide to be wealthy and that's why they retire poor. And the second requirement if you want to achieve greater success is simply this. Learn from the experts, study successful men and women and do what they do, and you'll be successful too. It sounds simple, doesn't it? If you want to be successful, you study success, you become an expert on success. And I'm um, always astonished that men and women think about success day and night, and yet very few of them ever read about it, ever study it, ever listen to tapes, ever take courses or seminars. They seem to excuse them by feeling that these are the sort of things that they're going to learn by osmosis. At age 25, I started and built a hundred person sales force covering six countries, doing a million dollars per month in business by simply practicing some principles I had learned at that time from books and picked up from other people. However, as time went on, I lost those principles. I forgot the principles and I reached my state at the age of 30 where I had no skill. I had no training. I was deeply in debt. I was going nowhere. And that's the point at which I made a decision. I made the decision I was going to be successful and I was going to do whatever was necessary to achieve it. I was going to pay whatever price was necessary to accomplish my goals. This was my turning point. I sat down, and I thought through everything I had learned in my 30 years. I'd read many books on success, and I listened to many tapes, and I attended many courses, and I developed a simple system based on the best success principles I had found, and then I put it to work. By 1985, five years later, my simple success system had brought my income up to over a million and a half dollars. I increased my income by a hundred times in 10 years. 
And what I discovered over the years of study and practice was simply this. If you design a success system and follow it, you will be far more successful than if you don't. Any system based on sound principles is better than no system at all. But recently, they've been dividing new business startups into two categories. The first category is businesses started by people with five years or more of business experience. And the second category is businesses started by people with no business experience at all. Then, the statistics turn out to be very different for these groups. Businesses started by people with experience in business have a 90 or better success rate, whereas businesses started by people with no experience have a 99 failure rate. If you don't have any experience, how can you make a business successful? Business is too complicated. The reasons are obvious why people with experience succeed, and like people without experience, fail. It's the same in life. People with knowledge and experience succeed, and people without it fail. We know that the more successful you are, the more successful you are, the more successful experiences you have, the more likely it is that you will be successful in other things. We know that the fewer success experiences and the less success knowledge you have, the less likely it is that you will be successful. Do you know the success rate for an established franchise, one that's been in business for at least five years? Well, according to the experts, it's 70 to 90 percent success rate. McDonald's, for instance, has over 8,600 outlets, and they haven't had a failure in 25 years. Now, why should this be? Well, the reason is simple. A franchise is a proven success system. It is a system based on years of trial and error. All you have to do with a franchise is to do what you're told. Follow the system and your success is almost guaranteed. A McDonald's executive told me once that every single farmer that has ever bought a McDonald's franchise has been extremely successful. Whereas very often, the uh, and people from the universities and people with previous business experiences will buy franchises and they'll try to change the system instead of following the success principles. They'll try to change the system and they run into nothing but problems. One of the great keys to success is to use proven success methods learned from the experts. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Life is too short for that. Surprisingly enough, most people either never study success, or if they do, they ignore what they've learned and try to do it all on their own. Let's look at some of the general principles of success we've discovered over the years. Number one principle, most important of all, is that success begins inside you. It starts from the inside out. It is a state of mind. It is a function of your character and your personality. Remember, it is not what you do so much as who you are that counts. Number two, the psychology of success simply equals mental fitness, which is a feeling of self-confidence, happiness, enthusiasm, and a positive mental attitude. Because if you have feelings of unshakable self-confidence, happiness, enthusiasm, and a positive mental attitude, nothing in the world can stop you from being successful. Number three, your level of self-esteem, how much you like yourself, how much you respect yourself and accept yourself as a valuable and worthwhile person, is the foundation quality of all success, all high achievement, and all peak performance. The more you like yourself, the better you do everything you turn your hand to. Point number four, the purposeful development of self-esteem, the psychology of success. Everything you do that makes you feel more positive towards yourself and your life builds your self-esteem and improves your level of mental fitness. In other words, when you use proven success methods every single time you do and you get a positive result, you get a jolt of self-esteem and self-confidence that makes you feel great about yourself and enthuses you to go on to the next effort. Number five, true self-esteem arises from an enhanced feeling of competence. Everything you do that gives you a greater sense of mastery and achievement boosts your self-esteem. Number six, your self-esteem is largely determined by how much you believe in yourself. Your beliefs, more than anything else, determine your reality. You always think and act in a manner consistent with your innermost convictions. If you change your beliefs, you change your life. Many people think that you have to be very intelligent to be successful in life. Exhaustive research shows 
that many self-made millionaires have only average intelligence. The reason why this helps them is because they never become impressed with how smart they are. And they're always trying to learn more. They're always curious and open and asking questions and it's this that gets them the information that guarantees their success. Many people think you have to go to college in order to be successful. There's an enormous number of self-made millionaires and successful people in every field who never went to college. As a matter of fact, half the college graduates in America are working for people who didn't finish high school, in my estimation. Number seven, your level of self-esteem is determined by how much you believe yourself to be valuable, competent, worthwhile, respected, and important. Everything you do, every experience you have that causes you to feel more valuable raises your self-esteem. Every experience that causes you to feel less important or less valuable lowers your self-esteem, undermines your self-esteem, undermines your self-concept, and impairs your effectiveness. Number eight, the opposites of self-esteem are fear, stress, psychosomatic illness, personality, problems, negativity, cynicism, mediocrity, defeat, failure in life. In fact, I feel that almost all human problems stem from low self-esteem, stem from the fact that people don't like themselves very much. Fears of failure, fears of poverty and rejection, fears of poverty and rejection, fears of criticism and fears of loss that hold us back are all rooted in low self-esteem. Number nine, it is possible to change your feelings, their attitudes, your opinions, your ideas and beliefs about yourself by feeding your mind with a steady stream of positive constructive messages that are consistent with the outcomes you desire rather than the outcomes you fear. If you do become what you think about, it's very important that you continually feed your mind with thoughts, words, pictures, ideas, and images that are consistent with the person you want to be, with the qualities and attributes you want to be, with the qualities and attributes you want to have, with the lifestyle that you desire. Number 10, you should use positive affirmations, which is called positive self-talk. If you like, Repeat it over and over to yourself with enthusiasm and conviction. In other words, emotionalize the things that you say to yourself. Say things to yourself like, I like myself, 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 I like myself. Whenever you say that, your self-esteem goes up. Whenever you say that, you feel better about yourself and you perform better. Number 11, visualization. Practice visualizing yourself with the qualities, attributes, and behaviors you desire. Create clear mental pictures of your desired results over and over. And the last thing you do before you go to sleep at night is visualize yourself performing excellently. Visualize yourself enjoying having achieved your goals. Visualize yourself as the person you would like to be. Remember your subconscious mind is activated by mental pictures and it then makes all your words and actions fit, pattern consistent with your most intensely desired goals. It controls your body language, it controls your tone of voice, it controls your levels of energy. So, the more you think and talk and visualize what it is you want to accomplish, the more likely it is you want to accomplish, the more likely it is you will say and do exactly the right things to cause it to happen. Number 12, when you use affirmations and visualization in combination with an attitude of positive expectations, you do two things. First of all, you become a positive, optimistic, cheerful person with a kind of attitude that is essential to success. And you can't imagine a really successful person who is not positive, optimistic, and cheerful. Number two, you begin attracting into your life people and circumstances in harmony with your dominant thoughts. This is called the law of attraction. And what it says is that whatever thoughts dominate your thinking, you're going to attract people and circumstances into your life that harmonize with them. And this law of attraction works whether your dominant thoughts are positive or negative. So be careful. If you keep your thoughts positive, you'll attract positive circumstances. And if your thoughts are negative, you'll attract negative circumstances. Number 13, feed your mind continually with positive books, magazines, tapes, videos, and seminars. Avoid negative people, negative books, negative newspapers, negative magazines, negative stories. Feed your mind with positive information, which helps you, which is consistent with where you want to go and what you want to be. You see, you are very susceptible to what is called power of suggestion, and you are influenced by every suggestive element 
and you're influenced by every suggestive element in your environment. You're influenced by what people say in the books you read, the newspaper headlines, and the news on television. And if you do not consciously keep your suggestive environment positive, it will tend, in our society, to be predominantly negative. Number 14. Associate with positive, cheerful, optimistic, success-oriented people. Remember, birds of a feather do flock together. And the choice of negative people to associate with condemns you to a lifetime of failure and underachievement. Dr. David McClellan at Harvard University found in 25 years of research that the choice of a negative reference group, the people that you associate with and identify with, can sink you in spite of all the education, opportunities, advantages that are given to you. Remember, you can't fly with the eagles if you scratch with the turkey. Get around winners. Get around positive people. Get away from negative people. Get out of negative people. Get out of negative corporate environments. Get out of negative relationships. Don't associate with losers. It doesn't matter how long you've known them. If you associate with losers, you will be a loser. And if you associate with winners, you will be a winner. And, by the way, sometimes people say, well, if I disassociate myself from my friends, how am I going to meet successful, positive, winning human beings? Don't worry about it. If you start thinking of success, if you start feeding your mind with a steady stream of messages that are consistent with success, if you start visualizing yourself as successful, you will attract by this law of attraction, you attract into your life people who are like yourself. Number 15. Act the part. Pattern your conduct, behavior, and actions after successful people if you want to be successful. Remember success starts from within, not from without. If you have low self-esteem or a poor self-image or if you lack self-confidence as I did as everybody does initially, it's very difficult to change merely by thinking about it. It means that you can act your way into feeling high levels of self-esteem by doing the same things that people with high self-esteem do. Mental fitness is like physical fitness. It can be learned through repetition and practice. Remember, mental fitness is positive self-esteem, high levels of self-confidence and courage, and you can learn it by practicing. This was the secret that turned my life around, and I have since learned that it's the key reason for the success of thousands of ordinary men and women. Well, what have we learned? Number one, top of the list, most important, success is not an accident. It is a skill. It is predictable, and it can be learned by you, and it can be learned by anyone. And the sooner you learn this skill, and the sooner you become an expert in the skills of success, the sooner you achieve the great things that you were born to accomplish. Number two, if you want to be successful, you must use proven success methods. You must learn from other successful people. You must study successful people. You must interview successful people. You must find out everything you can about success from every source possible. You must become an authority on it. Number three, the great majority of people fail in life. That is, they do not fulfill their potential and achieve the health, wealth, and happiness of which they're capable. They sell themselves short. They settle for far less. Number four, your level of self-esteem, how much you like yourself, how much you respect yourself and accept yourself and regard yourself, how much you esteem yourself is the most important single determinant of your success. When you are successful, you feel tremendous about yourself and when you are not, you don't. And everything that happens that builds yourself. Esteem is going to move you more rapidly toward achieving your goals in life. Number five, remember everyone suffers fears of failure and fears of rejection, self-doubt, lack of confidence, feelings of inferiority, inadequacy, and guilt. Guilt is the great problem of the 20th century. Feelings of inferiority come from childhood. Fears of failure and rejection go back to the destructive criticism in our early formative years. Remember this. Successful people are not people who don't suffer those emotions. They're simply people who have learned how to master those emotions through practice, and so can you. Number six. You become what you think about. The stream of thoughts, words, and pictures that flow through your mind determine your personality, your attitude, your behavior, and your results in life. And finally, number seven is this. The great discovery of behavioral psychology is that if you engage in the same actions as positive, focused, self-confident, successful people, you will come to think, feel, and act like them, naturally. 
that even if you don't feel like it, if you pretend, if you fake it until you make it, if you act the part, you will begin to think, walk, talk, act, feel like a successful person is naturally is breathing in, breathing out. Successful people are not people without problems. They have just as many problems, largely the same kind as everyone else. The difference is that they learn to solve their problems. Successful living is nothing more than the ability to successfully solve the problems which are as much a part of living as breathing. The problem with the great majority of individuals is not with their ability to achieve their goals in life, but rather with the failure to understand two factors vital to successful living. The first is to make the decision as to what it is we want enough to give it most of our attention until it's been achieved and to it's been achieved and to clearly define it. And the second is to fully understand that we have the ability to achieve this goal or we wouldn't want it in the first place. The next vital rule to successful living is to understand that our success is won or lost by our ability to serve others. Our rewards in life will and must always be in exact proportion to our service. It is the misunderstanding of the single law which is responsible for fully 90% of the frustration and discontent we see around us. A lot of people don't like this law but not liking a law does nothing to change it. Basic laws of nature and economics are unchanging. Thomas Huxley put it, to those who know and work with the laws they are paid with the overflowing sort of generosity with which they delight in strength. Yeah. Look where you will. You will find this law in undeviating operation. Our rewards will always be in exact proportion to our service. All attempts to sidestep or in any way avoid this law will result in frustration and failure. So let's take a moment to try to understand people. The more we understand them, the better we can serve them. People down through the centuries have, with the most amazing consistency, divided themselves into two groups. One group contains about 5% of any given population. The other group contains the remaining 95. The big group, the one containing about 95% of the people, never seems to get the word while the smaller group, the 5% does. Tape. All of us want the same things, but only about 5% figure out how to get them. Within each of us burns two unquenchable ambitions. To serve importantly and to gain financial independence. But according to statistics, only about 5% achieve both of them. Why? Every human being has a tendency to think, act, and talk like those by whom he is surrounded. We've already pointed out that 95% don't seem to get the word in life that he is surrounded by the larger group. That he will continue to conform to his group, unless we can do a better job of serving him through knowledge. The failure of most people to live successfully is not caused by their lack of abilities, in their failure to decide what it is they want, and understanding that our wants are governed by our talents and abilities. Anyone who knows where he is going in life is a success at the moment he makes the decision of what it is he intends to accomplish. Once this goal has been accomplished, he is again by our definition of failure, till he establishes a new goal toward which to work. For this is to live and live completely, to know as much as we can know, to serve as much as we can serve, to accomplish as much as we can accomplish. Well. Why are we faced with only 5% who can be called really successful? Because the best estimates available tell us that only about 5% will ever decide upon and define the one thing they want. We know that the happiest people on earth are those who know exactly what it is. They seek and set boldly out to find it. The fortunate ones are those who have found the dream so exciting and worthwhile that they'll be voted by for all of their lives to making that dream come true but with a great majority never realizing that a persistent daydream is often the point on which we should set our compass, the place toward which it is meant for us to journey. The tragedy is that the great majority shrugs off this built-in direction finder and returns, which they feel must be the best road because it carries the heaviest traffic. For it is the road of the 95%. It is the road with no more opportunity and with 19 times as much competition. Of all the billions of human beings who've lived on Earth, all great ideas have come from just a handful. Every great leader and thinker has been scorned, ridiculed, poisoned, imprisoned, stolen, pilloried, burned at the stake, or crucified. Mankind as a group has made a consistently grisly game of tormenting its savior. It comes from following the wrong crowd, 
Well, what can we learn? We've got to have individual goals, individual thinking, and individual action. And two, we must never conform to the great mass of people. We must never lose our individuality and identity by permitting ourselves to be submerged in the suffocating sea of indirection and purposelessness. There's nothing wrong with emulation so long as we emulate a person who represents that which we wish to become, but never the crowd, never the 95%. Our minds are thinking controls our destinies here on earth to a degree totally unsuspected by the great majority of people. And if we can control our minds, we can pretty well tell our own future. If we're confused about what we wish to become or accomplish our lives, our environment will mirror that confusion. We as individuals can call our own shots for the rest of our lives. We can know what it means to go through life from one success to another. We can know what it means to have peace of mind and live calm, cheerful, successful life. In five years from now, you can be and have anything you set your entire mind and heart upon. Succeeding in life has always been a matter of doing that which the great majority does not do. And it isn't that I want to make an invidious comparison between the 5% and the 95. Not at all. That's just the way it is. And if we don't recognize it, it will be to our cost. The trick is not in achieving our goals, it is in establishing. A ship would never leave a harbor if it did not have a destination. If you were to climb to the navigation bridge, and ask the captain the name and location of his next port of call. He would tell you immediately. Can you tell anyone your destination just as quickly and in one sentence? The captain of the ship knows that he can arrive at only one port at a time. He also knows that his destination will be invisible, fully 99 of his voyage. But if he knows it's there, and that he'll reach it barring an unforeseen catastrophe, if you will just keep doing certain things a certain way every day, one fine morning, his destination will appear on the horizon. By understanding that he can reach only one port at a time, the owner of a ship can, in the short space of a very few years, reach hundreds of ports successfully, devoting its life to accomplishing its mission and contributing its share to the welfare and economy of the world. Men and women who follow this sensible, obvious and meaningful way of life will do the same. These are the unfortunate people who, not knowing the rules, believe that circumstance controls our lives. They believe in luck and superstitions, fate, the breaks, and while they cling to their false alibis, life passes them by. Remembering that the definition of success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. What's the ideal toward which you are working now, today, yesterday, and tomorrow? Can you write it in one sentence? Is your goal sharply and clearly defined? Every job, no matter what it may be, holds somewhere within itself the key to everything we want in life, the key to greatness. That we must look for, and we must think, decide to become a professional at your business. You see, we can either compete or create. And when we begin to do this, there's no limit to that which we can achieve. Everyone wants security, but one in ten can tell you what it is. There is only one place on earth you can find secure. It's inside of a person, never outside. If a man has security inside where it belongs, you can see him walking down the street and you can feel it when he enters a room. That's security and you can't take it away from him. This man or this woman has security where it belongs. And you know where it comes from? It comes from doing what we do for a living surpassingly well and it comes from knowledge, planning and working for what we sell. Who we sell and how to sell. Those three subjects would fill a large library. But we can take things one at a time. And by devoting an hour a day to study, we can become outstanding professionals in five years or second planning. This means writing down the specific goal we're now working toward. It means selecting the income we feel will represent financial independence to us. Once this has been selected, we know exactly what we must do in order to reach it. As soon as our first goal has been reached, we can set a new one. It's a result of planning and working positively that attracts the good things to us. Whatever your goal may be, write it down in detail. Then like the ship, you're on course and you reach more successful ports in a few years than most men do in a lifetime. Third, working, working more than the average. If we're going to achieve more than average results, it is necessary to work. We need energy, and energy is inextricably linked to desire. 
unless we have a desire to do a certain thing. We find ourselves without energy once our goal has been crystallized in our minds, and we realize that we become what we think about. Our doubts vanish as to whether or not we can achieve our desired ends compared with what we ought to be. We're making use of only a small part of our possible mental and physical resources. He possesses powers of various sorts which he habitually fails to use. He energizes below his maximum and he behaves below his optimum. And that by pushing past the first false feeling of fatigue, we will find an exhilarating second wind that will take us to our goals. And studying the lives of the world's great men and women, we find they seem to be indefatigable. Frequently people find it difficult to establish a goal toward which to work. Here's a good way to solve the problem. Get off by yourself and where you can think without being disturbed. Then write on a sheet of paper a complete description of the person you would like to be and the things in being this person you would have. Carry as often as you can a clear mental image of the person you would be and begin to be that person. Soon this will become so knit with habit it will lead you without fail to the goal you seek. And you'll become what you think about. The only thing that sets us apart as human beings is our divine minds. Our minds represent our hope and our future. Yet, as a rule, it is the last place the average person will turn to for help. By devoting an hour a day to study, you're building your mind into a powerful and creative servant. If you only do this five days a week, it comes to 260 hours a year. That's 1300 hours in five years, or the equivalent of 162. Eight hour days devoted to studies and research. In five years, you'll be one of the most accomplished professionals in your field, and you will have the world on a string. Now let's sum up and reduce the whole thing to a workable formula, a set of rules for this game of life that cannot fail to take us to where we wish to go. The first and most important thing to remember is the rule that controls our life. This means that we must establish a worthwhile goal toward which to work, a goal that will occupy our mind most of the time. You must fully understand emotionally as well as intellectually that whatever it is we set our heart upon will become real in our lives. We must also remember the law that lies as the basic foundation for all economics and personal. And if we want to get into the top 5% of the people, we must often cut ourselves away from the effects of our environment and become individuals with individual goals, individual thinking and individual actions. We must realize that our daily work contains more opportunities than we could develop in a lifetime and that our job contains within itself the key to greatness the road to everything we could possibly want in life for ourselves and our families. We must realize too that security can be found in one place only, inside of us. And the only road to security lies in doing what we do for a living surpassingly well. And lastly, that we must become professionals at what we do and that becoming a pro involves knowledge, planning and working. Planning by establishing the goal which automatically establishes our work pattern. But it took time, dedication, and work in its accomplishment. Is it worth it? You bet it is, and you will become what you think of that. Other two major sources of value in the world of work today. The first is time, and the second is knowledge. Today, time is the currency of modern business. The most important measure of time is duration or speed. The most important quality that you can develop with regard to time is a sense of urgency. A sense of urgency is the habit of moving fast when an opportunity presents itself to you. Develop a bias for action. Fast tempo is essential to success. All successful people not only work hard, 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 but they work fast, 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 fast. Now, 
Everyone must stay focused on reducing the amount of time that it takes to get the same results. Customers will pay dearly for anyone who can reduce the time needed to get them the products and services that they want. People will pay more for someone who can satisfy their needs faster than someone else. Especially when it comes to managing your time. When it comes to looking at what you should do on a day-to-day -day basis. Focus on results, not activities. You will always have too much to do in too little time. They say the average person has about 300 hours of projects to take care of right now. Books to read, magazines, newspapers, projects at home, work, and everything else. The fact is, you will never get caught up. So what they have found, and this is one of the great secrets of time management, is that you only get your life under control to the degree to which you stop doing things. Let me repeat that. Stop doing things. Now, one of the things that you stop doing, well, the easiest way to set priorities and to determine this is to use the 80-20 rule. If you make a list of 10 things that you have to do each day, two of those items will be worth more than all the other eight put together. The top 20% of activities account for 80% of your results. So you have to say to yourself, what are the one or two things on this list that are more important than anything else? And of all these things, if I could only do one thing before I was called out of town for a month, which one thing would I be sure to get done today? And that becomes your number one priority. Now, over the years, the ability to set priorities. And I have written books on time management. I've trained hundreds of thousands of people in time management. My audio and video programs on time management are in multiple languages worldwide. And everything comes down to one thing. Selecting your most important task right now and starting on it right now and then disciplining yourself to stay on it until it's done. If you make the mistake of trying to clear up small things first, you'll find out the small things multiply and pretty soon you've spent your whole day doing little things. Sometimes people ask me, why am I so productive? How is it that I can write four books a year, give a hundred talks, run free businesses and do so much stuff? volunteer nature traveling all over the world well the answer is my organization system I began to study time management and I've studied time management now for 15 years I have spent thousands and thousands of dollars on the subject I've got libraries of books I've been to countless courses I've listened to all the audio cassettes I've bought them used every time planner that's ever been made with regard to time management and uh, I found that there's a core element in time management and it's the element of priorities. And I think that the ability to focus and concentration are the two keys to success in life. The ability to focus clearly and know exactly what it is you want to accomplish. And the ability to concentrate single-mindedly on accomplishing that one thing without diversion or distraction by the keys to success. It's the number one key to effectiveness is to be able to sit down and look at your work and use the 80-20 rule. Say to yourself, which is the 20 of the number of things that I have to do that account for 80 of the number of things that I have to do that account for 80 of the value of my work and always work on the top 20. You see, in life, there's never enough time to do everything but there's always enough time to do the important things. Instead of doing what is fun and easy, which is what most people do, you know, they make a list of everything they have to do and then they start at the bottom of the list and they work on the irrelevant things. At the end of the day, they haven't got anything done. Successful people, peak performers, concentrate on the top items. And remember, anything other than working on the top items on your list is a waste of your time. Time management is not just time management. Time management is life management. You can do anything you want with your life if you'll manage your time properly. We all have the same 24 hours a day and the ability to concentrate, 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 to discipline yourself, to use willpower and perseverance to concentrate on one thing at a time is a quality of all success. Nothing great has ever been accomplished without the ability to concentrate single-mindedly on one thing at a time. Always concentrate on the best use of your time. 
There's probably no skill that's more closely correlated with success and achievement in every part of your life than the ability to manage your time well. It'll bring you to the attention of your superiors faster. It'll help you get more done in a shorter period of time. It'll make you feel better about yourself. It'll lead to faster promotions, higher status, greater pay, and everything. Time management is essential to your health as well. Not just your productivity, but you only feel good about yourself to the degree to which you feel you're in control of your time and your life. In fact, the major reason for stress in America is a feeling of being out of control, a feeling of having too much to do and too little time to do it in. Here's my favorite time management question which I give to you for free. It's simply this. Before you start anything, ask yourself, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? A, use, make a list and say, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? When you get into your car, say, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? When you leave the house or leave the office, say, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? Ask yourself that question over and over and over again. Repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it until it's driven into the subconscious mind as a command. And whenever you have a temptation to do something that is small and irrelevant, that command will go, bam, what is the most valuable use of your time right now? And it'll push you into doing what is the most valuable use of your time. And whenever you're working on the most valuable use of your time, you feel great. You get concentrated effort as a source of energy and enthusiasm. It makes you feel wonderful when you're working on something important, and it makes you feel nothing when you're working on something irrelevant. Now, procrastination is not only the thief of time, it is also the thief of life. To outperform your competition both inside and outside your organization, you must develop a time management habit of moving quickly when something needs to be done. You must develop a reputation for speed and dependability. The wonderful advantage of developing a sense of urgency in the habit of moving fast is that the faster you move, the better you get. This is because the faster you move, the more experience you get. The faster you move, the more you learn, and the more competent you become. The faster you move, the more energy and enthusiasm you have. People who move fast as a way of life soon develop a totally different temperament and personality than people who move slowly or who take a casual attitude toward their work. My friend Jim Ron used to say, casualness brings casualties. In its simplest terms, successful people are more productive than unsuccessful people. Successful people have better habits. They dream bigger dreams. They work from written goals. They stay focused on what they need to get done. They do what they love to do and they concentrate on getting better and better and better at it. They use their natural abilities to the fullest. They're continually generating ideas to solve problems and to achieve company goals. They focus on using every minute of their time to get maximum results. Develop a sense of urgency. A sense of urgency is a quality that is possessed by only 2% of the population. 2% of the population do things fast. 2% of the population have a bias for action. Until in Tom Peters' wonderful book, In Search of Excellence, he says all the excellent companies have a bias for action, and all of the companies that do not classify or do not come into the excellence category do things when they get around to it. You call them up and you have a problem or a complaint, you hear from them three or four weeks later. But the excellent companies, you call up with a problem or complaint. Bang, there's somebody back to you in two minutes. If you ever want to experience, call, um, call Hewlett Packard and say, I'm having a problem getting some information. I'm having a problem with my CE. They won't let you off the phone until they've taken care of you. But the excellent companies, you call up with a problem or complaint. Bang, there's somebody back to you in two minutes. If you ever want to experience, Call him, call Hewlett Packard and say, I'm having a problem getting some information. I'm having a problem with my CE. They won't let you off the phone until they've taken care of you. You call the other companies, they'll say, it's not my job. Let's say the guy who takes care of that isn't here. When will you be back? I don't know. You take a message. I don't have a pencil. Farm. And then they can't understand why they're struggling.
You know that 80, 20 of the companies make 80 of the profits in every industry, interestingly enough. So develop a sense of urgency. Get the reputation as the person who does things fast. Develop a reputation for speed and dependability and your future will just open up in front of you. Imagine if you own a company and you had two people in the company and both of them were reasonably well talented. Both of them were doing reasonably well, except one person had a sense of urgency and did things fast. Every time you gave them something to do, they took it. They ran with it like a ball player catching a fumble and running for the goal line. The other person got to it after lunch, maybe next Monday or no rush. Week's almost over, Thursday afternoon and so on. Which one would you give additional responsibility to? Which one would you promote? Which one would you spend money training? Which one would you send to places where you needed help? It's always the person with a sense of urgency. I can tell you this, that the sense of urgency for me has been worth hundreds of thousands of dollars as a consultant. I have been able to save my clients sometimes millions of dollars by acting fast when they've given me a project to take care of. Whereas if I had acted even a day later, it could have cost a fortune. And if you'll develop that habit of working fast, working fast, that sense of urgency, act now, do it now, do it now, do it now. In selling, especially somebody calls you up and has a question, get back to them now. Somebody has a problem, get back to them now. Somebody needs something, move on it quickly. If you have to forego coffee breaks or lunch or something else, move fast. If you develop that reputation for speed, it will be worth a fortune to you. It will be worth a fortune to you. It's a little while, but it's a habit. Most people just sort of shuffle through life, you know, they get to it when they feel like it. But all the excellent people, all the excellent people, all the excellent people, all the high performers have a sense of urgency. I want to give you four time management tips for work. Life balance. Now time management behaviors are very much a matter of choice. You choose to be efficient, or you choose to be efficient, or you choose to be disorganized. You choose to focus and concentrate on your highest value tasks, or you choose to spend your time on activities that contribute very little to your life. Choose to be positive, or you choose to be negative, and you're always free to choose. Now, the starting point of overcoming your previous programming and eliminating the mental blocks to time management is for you to make a clear, unequivocal decision to become excellent at the way you use your time. You must decide right here and now that you're going to become an expert in time management to improve the quality of your life. Your aim should be to manage your time so well that people look up to you and use you as a role model for their own work habits. There are four time management methods that you can use to program yourself for peak performance to improve your work. Life balance. Here they are. First of these methods for programming your subconscious mind is positive self talk or the use of positive self talk or the use of positive affirmations. These are commands that you pass from your conscious mind to your subconscious mind. Positive affirmations are statements that you say either out loud or you say to yourself, but with the same emotion and enthusiasm that drives the words into your subconscious mind as new operating instructions. So to improve your time management, you can continually repeat positive affirmations such as I have beautiful work, life balance, or I concentrate easily on my highest payoff task. My favorite time management affirmation is I use my time well. I use my time well. I use my time well. And I repeat this to myself over and I repeat this to myself over and over again. When you repeat positive affirmations over and over, they're eventually accepted by your subconscious mind as part of your new programming. You will then find that your external behaviors will start to reflect your internal programming to improve your work, life balance, and quality of life, life balance, and quality of life. Now, the second technique that you can use to program your subconscious mind is through visualization mental pictures. Most immediately influence your subconscious mind in self ime psychology. The person you see is the person you will be. Through positive affirmations and clear mental pictures, so begin to see yourself as well, organized and efficient and effective in time management. Recall and recreate memories and pictures of yourself when you were performing at your best, when you felt very efficient and effective.
and in control. Think of a time when you were working efficiently and in your, efficiently and effectively and getting through an enormous amount of work. Play this picture over and over of yourself on the screen of your subconscious mind until your subconscious mind accepts this as your reality. Now the third time management technique is simple. Sit or lie in a quiet place where you can be completely alone in the silence. True positive affirmations Imagine yourself going through an important upcoming experience such as a meeting or a presentation or a negotiation or a negotiation or even a date that would improve the quality of your life. As you sit or lie completely relaxed, create a picture of the coming event and see it unfolding perfectly in every respect, like a movie in your mind. See yourself as calm and positive and in complete control. See the other people doing and saying exactly what you would want them to do if the situation was perfect. The fourth mental technique will change the quality of your life through the experience of time management. Imagine that you have been selected for a role in a movie or stage play. In this role, you are to act the part of a person who's extremely well organized in every respect. As you go through your daily life, as you go through your daily life, imagine you are an actor who is playing this part who is already very good at time management. Act as if you are already using your time efficiently and well. Pretend that you are an expert in personal efficiency and time management. Fake it until you make it. When you pretend that you are excellent in time management eventually, the action which is under your direct control will develop a mindset or the belief in your subconscious mind. In other words, you can act yourself into feeling and believing yourself to be excellent in time management. The Greeks said that moderation in all things is the key to a happy life. Moderation. Now sometimes people say, well, I don't have time for my family, I don't have time to exercise, I don't have time for this and time for that. Whenever you find yourself getting out of sync with regard to balance, and especially when you feel that you don't have the time, is when you most need to stop and think. So here's the question to ask. What would I do if I only had six months to live? If you find yourself working too hard or not spending time in your relationship, not spending time with the people you care about and who care about you, ask yourself, what would I do if I only had six months to live? And if what you would do is spend more time with the important people in your life, the time to start spending that time is now. So what would you do if you had six months to live? You know, it's an old joke the doctors say they've never met a businessman on his deathbed who said, boy, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. The fact of the matter is that balance and moderation in all things increase your productivity, increase your efficiency. And remember, the only reason you're working is so that you can enjoy the great things of life which are your people, your relationships, the things that make you happy and so on. Imagine that you are financially independent, that you have cast 20 million in the bank. And simultaneously, you only have 10 years to live. You're going to enjoy superb health, but you have all the money that you need, and you have to work at something. You cannot be a layabout. So therefore, if you could work at anything, and you had all the money you needed, and you didn't want to waste any time, what career would you choose? If you could wave a magic wand and have all the talent and skill that you need to be successful in any field, what field would you choose for yourself? And then what you do is you just start to do some research on that field, working it part-time, working it for free, reading books and courses, talking to people who are in it. I've spoken to literally thousands of people over the years who did that and eventually changed out of their current job, sometimes within the same company, sometimes out of their current job where they weren't very satisfied, into a new job that they loved. And they became a star at that new job. You can do the same. Everybody can do this. I'm going to give you a law that is my favorite law of time management and it's called the law of three. This law alone will enable you to be one of the most productive and successful people in your world. The law of three is based on my 30 years of study into time management. And what it basically says is that if you make a list of everything that you have to do in a week or a month, you'll come up with 20 or 30. Some people write down 40 or 50 tasks or activities. But if you look at this list, you'll find there are only three activities that you engage in in your life. 
that account for 90% of the value that you contribute in your life. Wherever you are in life, there's only nine, three things that account for 90% of your happiness. Only three things. This law of three works everywhere and it works for everyone. It works if you're a doctor, an investment banker, a salesperson, a business owner, or a student. Whatever there is, always three. So what you do is you make a list of everything you do and then you ask three questions. Question number one is, if I could only do one thing on this list all day long, which one activity would have the greatest positive impact on my life? Or you could say I could only do one activity all day long, which one activity would help me to double my income faster than anything else? And that answer is usually pretty obvious. So you put a circle around there. And then you ask it again, if I could only do two things all day long, what would be the second most valuable thing that I could do? You, uh, you go through your list and you'll come up with number two. And then you ask the question the third time, if I would only do three things all day long, what would be number three? And you circle it. Now I put every one of my students through this exercise and they're all astonished because in a few minutes they see clearly that these are the three most important things that they do in achieving their goals of health, wealth, and happiness. And so the rule is this. Do fewer things in your daily life, but do more important things and do them more of the time and they get better. Improve in each one of those areas in your life. There's three things that you do that are more important than everything else. And these will change over time. But you must be clear about those three things. And if you start working on only those three things, you will double your productivity performance and output very quickly. If you can concentrate on the three most important things you do well, there's four requirements for you to make these techniques work for you. We call these the four Ds. The first D is desire. It's when you must have a burning desire to be effective at time management. The second D is decision. You must make a decision that you are going to become an expert in this subject. You are going to take this course. You're going to use these materials. You're going to practice them over and over again because what we have found is in the absence of a decision, nothing ever happens. You need a clear, unequivocal do or die burn. The Bridges decision that this is a subject that you are going to master. The third D is discipline. You must discipline yourself to practice and repeat over and over again. Good time management techniques. In fact, we say that time management is self-discipline in action. And the ability to discipline yourself more than anything else is going to determine your success in life. And the fourth D to become excellent in time management is determination. You must have the ability to persist. You must have the determination to keep on keeping at it, on and at it, long enough until you become very, very good in this field. But I promise you this, the payoff is tremendous because you see, time management is really life management. Everything that you do to improve the quality of your time management will improve and enhance every part of your life. You can even say it this way. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of your time management. The quality of your life will be determined by the way you use your time minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day. Because your time is your life. In every single study of high performing men and women, we find that intense result orientation goes hand in hand with big payoffs in life. You see, it's not how much time you put in or the activities that you engage in or how sincere or how intelligent or competent or capable or anything else. It's only what you produce, the results that you get from the time that you put in, that counts in determining your rewards. Not only your psychic rewards, how good you feel about yourself, but your financial rewards. You're always paid in direct proportion to the quality and the quantity of the results that you produce. We call this the law of sowing and reaping, the law of cause and effect. The cause of everything that happens to you is your ability to get results. And the easier rewards, if you want to increase the quality and quantity of your rewards, you have to think all the time about increasing the quality and quantity of your results. Now, the second point is this. Most people are very unproductive. Most people cannot do a full day's work if their life depended upon it. In fact, 
Every study that I've ever seen suggests that the average person works at only 50% of capacity. In fact, in most work environments, about 30% of all the work time is spent in socializing, gossiping, wasting time talking, chit, chatting, hanging around the water fountain, reading the newspaper, drinking coffee, and so on. What does it mean to you? It means that the average person is working at 50% or less of capacity. There are tremendous opportunities for you if you'll do some of the things that we talk about to rapidly move ahead of other people. The starting point of getting things done is the quality of neatness. The quality of neatness means that you start with a clean desk and you end with a clean desk. You start with a clean briefcase and you end with a clean briefcase. You take the time to make sure that your entire working environment looks neat, professional, productive, and effective. Remember this. It's not just what you do, but it's the perception of other people of what you do that counts. I read a story by a self-made millionaire who said that he built five successful companies and one of their critical rules was that Every single person kept a clean desk. Now, the fourth key in getting things done is the importance of focus. Focus, which leads to clarity, and we talk about this over and over again. Focus means that you're absolutely clear about what you're trying to accomplish. Focus means that you're absolutely clear about your key result areas and why you're on the payroll. We say that fuzzy focus leads to fuzzy results. Clear focus leads to clear results. And this means that you take the time to think. You take the time to think through. Why am I on the payroll? What have I been hired to accomplish? What are my key result areas? What are my core functions? What are the 20% of the things that I do that account for 80% of my results? And so on. So, the starting point in getting things done is focus and clarity. I call this the, it's like adjusting the camera all the time. So you keep your focus very, very clear. Well, the next key principle is concentration. Concentration is what you do is, once you've decided on the most important idea to achieve your most important goal, then you have to concentrate single-mindedly on one thing until it's complete. If Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, the richest man in the world and the third richest man, were at a dinner party at Bill Gates' home last year, and there were about a hundred guests standing around at the reception, drinking wine, and so on. These three men, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Bill Gates' father, are good friends, and they were standing and talking. One of the other guests came up and said, Excuse me, gentlemen, you are three of the most important people in the world. What would you say is the most important key to success today? And they stopped talking, and they all turned, and they said, Focus. Focus is the most important quality for success today. We're so surrounded by so many distractions of so many kinds that the ability to focus is more important for success than any other quality. Now, I developed a philosophy when I was young and broke, and the philosophy was that if rich, successful people tell you to do something, you should do it. If they tell you that this is a key to their success, then you should at least practice it for a while to see if it applies to you. What I have learned, and what I learned coaching my clients, my business owners, is I taught them how to focus. I taught them how to select specific goals and activities in each area of their life and how to focus like a laser beam on one goal at a time. If you can do that, you can conquer the world. Now, concentration is, in reality, where all the work and time management leads us to. It is the ability to concentrate 100% on one thing. Setting priorities, the most important thing, and to stay with that single task until it's finished. Concentration means moving forward in a straight line toward the goals and objectives that you've clearly identified. It means concentrating without diversion or distraction. Focus and concentration, I believe, in 25 years of research, are the reasons for success and happiness in life. The reasons for a lack of success and unhappiness are a lack of focus, a lack of concentration, I have found the most important time management or personal productivity principle of all, and it is this. Make a list of everything you do in the morning before you start work and then select the one item on that list that's more important than any others in terms of potential consequences, and then start on that one task and work on it 100% of the time until it's complete. Now, if you can do that, 
you can double and triple your productivity, become one of the highest paid and most respected people in your world. Select your most important task. Start on it immediately. Work on it 100% of the time until it's complete. Because here's what I discovered in 30 years of studying and writing books on time management. Task completion is the key to success. It is not tasks that you work on, but it's only the tasks that you complete. If you're a student, it's completing your assignments and your reports. If you're a salesperson, it's completing the sales. If you're a business person, it's completing different transactions. Everything in life is completing tasks. Now, here's a wonderful payoff. When you complete an important task, it gives you an increased sense of self-esteem and personal power. Your self-confidence goes up. You get more energy and more ideas. You feel happy about yourself. Whenever you complete a task, your brain gives you a rush of endorphins and endorphins make you happy, more alert, and more creative. They strengthen your immune system so that you're never sick. So you'll find that what successful people do is they're always starting and completing tasks and especially they start and complete them on time. Now what does this require? It requires our old friend and enemy, self-discipline. Now what we know about task completion is that not only is it the key to the future, not only is it the key to getting more and greater and better opportunities, but important task completion. Doing something that's important to you and carrying it through and finishing it 100% at the end is a source of energy, enthusiasm, and high self-esteem. Men and women who are working consistently on getting important things done and staying with it to the complete are more positive, they're more optimistic, they're more self-confident, they're full of confidence, they have more belief and self-assurance in themselves and they get more opportunities to complete more tasks. And here's the flip side, completing low priority tasks leads to stress. If you work and you get a, a lot of little things done but they're not moving you toward the accomplishment of things that are really important to you, what happens is you just feel crummy as a result. We find that the average Brit, average German, average French person works about 1600 hours a year. An average executive or business owner works about 2000 hours a year. So what you do is you take your annual income and you divide it by 2000. So let's say you're earning $100,000 a year divided by 2000. That means that you're earning $50 an hour. This is your hourly rate. Over time, you can include all your benefits and pensions and so on. But whatever this is, let's say your hourly income is $50 an hour. That means, by Ricardo's law, the law of comparative advantage, as formulated by David Ricardo, you don't do anything that pays less than $50 an hour. You only do things that pay you $50 an hour or more, or that people would pay you 50, sorry, 50 quid an hour or more to do, and everything else you delegate. If there's something that someone else can do for $10 an hour, you hire somebody to do that. $20 an hour, $30 an hour, you keep hiring people who can do tasks at a lower hourly rate than yourself. Now here's the great discovery, and this can be life-changing. I call it the law of three. The law of three says that no matter how many things you do, how many tasks you do in a week or a month, and it's usually 20 or 30, three of those tasks account for 90% of your value. Only three. You make a list of all of your tasks, and I do this with my business owners and I have them go through this and they're astonished. They double their income within 30 days because I ask them the three magic questions. Magic question number one. If you could only do one thing on this list, one task on this list all day long, which one task would have the greatest positive impact on your career? Which one task? Well, it'll usually pop. It'll jump out at you. So you put a circle around it. Then you say, if you could only do two things all day long, which would be number two, and you put a circle around that. If you could only do three things all day long, which would be number three, you put a circle around that. And suddenly, it's almost like all these other tasks fade. Again, like in a camera shot in a movie, a fade, and those three tasks are sitting there like those three magic tabs. And you realize, oh my God, those are the big three. Everything else is secondary. Everything else can be done by someone else or done later or not done at all. And then you focus on the three. So here's the rule for doubling your income and doubling it again. And I'll repeat it again. Do fewer things 
But do more important things and do them more often. And get better at them. Repeat. Do fewer things. The big three. Do more important things. Do more of them. Spend more of your day working on those three tasks. And then get better at those tasks so you can get more done faster at a higher level of quality. If you will practice the law of three, you'll transform your life. If you combine that with the eat the frog and work on your most important task, the one that can contribute the most value, and you can do that until it becomes a habit, just automatic. You get up in the morning and you just start working on your most important task. And you say, no, I don't do that. I don't do little tasks. Those are not my job. People say, what about this? What about that? I said, excuse me, I'm management, my labor. I do management tasks. I do my big three labor. There's all this other thing. So you person who's watching this right now is your management on labor. Think of yourself as management and do your three tasks. If you can do that until it becomes a habit, you're going to conquer the world. All of us over the course of our lives want to develop character and character has been defined several ways. One definition I like is that character is the ability to follow through on a resolution after the enthusiasm with which the resolution was made has passed. So taking this course, by the way, you'll make a lot of decisions and commitments and resolutions. The true measure of character is whether or not you have the capacity to follow through. Character, in effect, is self-discipline in action. Character is self-discipline in action. You can tell how much character you have by how willing you are to discipline yourself to make the sacrifices that are necessary in the short term to have a great life in the long term. Why is it that so many people fail in life? Self-improvement books are among the best-selling books in all the bookstores. Millions have read them, and yet the vast majority continue to live lives far below their potential, achieving far less than they're actually capable of. For years, I've studied success and failure, and I'm going to explain why people fail so you can be alert to these tendencies in yourself and others. So you can recognize the behaviors that lead to failure and make a conscious effort to avoid them. Why do people fail? Economists say that the inability to delay gratification is a primary predictor of economic failure in life. People fail because they do what is fun and easy rather than what is hard and necessary. Success and failure are more the result of habit than of anything else. Probably 90% or more of everything we do is dictated by habit, and once a habit, good or bad, is formed, we become comfortable with it. And then we strive to remain consistent with what we're familiar with, even if our habits are leading to failure. Psychologists call this tendency to become comfortable getting into our comfort zone. And even if our comfort zone is keeping us at a low level of performance, we stay in it rather than change. All change for the good in our lives begins by changing our thoughts and actions so that we form habits that assure our success and then make those habits our masters. The key is self-knowledge and self-awareness of why it is we feel and act and walk and talk. When we study human action, we find that human beings, all of us, value leisure. So given a choice between an easier or harder way, we will always choose the easier way because the sooner we get the job done, the sooner we can enjoy leisure, the sooner we can take it easy. Now, in this sense, we are all basically lazy. This is neither good nor bad as such. It is only what we do as a result of this laziness that is good or bad. All human progress in science and technology comes from the tendency for people to seek faster, easier ways to get the things that we want. So in a certain sense, laziness is a motivator to human progress. My second characteristic of human nature is that we each try to get the very most for the very least expenditure of money or effort. In this sense, then, we are all greedy. This is neither good nor bad, just basic human nature. We are greedy in that we always want the very most for the very least, and we are never satisfied, and we are continually striving to get more and more all of our lives. We are never ever really contented. The third characteristic is that each of us strives continually to improve the quality of our lives. We may not always succeed, but every action we take is an attempt to be better off than we would be without the action. In this sense, then, every human being is ambitious. So, so far, each of us is lazy, greedy, and ambitious. 
We may be ambitious for different things, and we may have more or less opportunity to realize our ambitions, but we are all ambitious. The fourth characteristic is that each person thinks, acts, feels, and experiences happiness or unhappiness by and for themselves. Everything we do, even charitable acts, we do because in our personal opinion, at that moment, it is the best thing for us as we see it. Selfishness, self-centeredness, is essential for survival and is neither good nor bad in itself. It just is a fact of human nature. A fifth characteristic of human nature is that because no one in the world can possibly know everything there is to know about even one subject, we are all acting on the basis of incomplete information every time we act. In this sense, we are all ignorant. No matter how much we learn, we must still act with some uncertainty, some ignorance of the facts, often with great ignorance, sometimes complete ignorance. Finally, as human beings, we have an ego. We think very highly of ourselves, as every study shows. We consider ourselves to be superior to others in many ways, in terms of intelligence, personality, appearance, leadership ability, and so on. Another way to put this is that we are all vain. This is neither good nor bad, just a normal facet of human nature. We all want basically the same things, in this order of priority, although we want them with different degrees of intensity and we settle for different levels of achievement in each of these areas. First of all, security. Security is number one. This is our basic need, the survival instinct. Security of life, limb, physical security, economic security, emotional security. We value security very, very highly. Any threat to our security in any area brings an immediate reaction to protect and defend. Lack of security makes us angry, fearful, and defensive. The second thing that we want is comfort. And this is what we go for once we've achieved what is to us an acceptable level of security. We seek comfort, especially physical comfort. We pay an enormous amount and work very hard to gain the comforts that we desire. The third thing, once we have enough comfort and security, we want to relax. We want to take time off, we want leisure, and we want to put up our feet. Leisure is a valued good, and we work very hard and pay dearly for it. Holidays are leisure, golf is leisure, tennis is leisure. These are the leisure time activities in our societies. They consume hundreds of billions of dollars. Remember, we are all basically lazy. We like leisure, and we will pay very highly for it. Number four is love. We seek the affection and the love of others. This is something we desire so intensely that we will even die for it. Each of us needs to be loved to feel fully human, and we strive for it all our lives. The fifth thing that we all want is respect. We need to be recognized and respected by others outside our family group. Because we are basically vain, we seek the praise and appreciation of other people. We will make great efforts to earn and keep the goodwill and respect of others toward us. And finally, the sixth thing that we want is fulfillment. Each of us has a deep inner craving for a sense of meaning and purpose in life. And here is the key point. The basic law of human nature is that people always tend to seek the fastest and easiest way to get the things they want, and usually to get the things they want right now. I call this the expediency factor or the E factor, and it explains why people succeed and why they fail. Families, corporations, organizations, and nations succeed and fail because of the unwillingness to delay gratification, as we spoke about earlier. The vast majority of people immediately act to get the things they want now, the fastest and easiest way, even if the long-term consequences of their actions will be ever achievement and failure. Here are some common examples with which we're all familiar. A young man drops out of high school to take a job to buy a car to impress the girls. That's the expedient thing to do, and the long-term price is a lifetime of low wages and frustrating work. This is called short-term gain for long-term pain. Unions strike for higher than market wages at the long-term price of permanently crippling the industry and causing permanent unemployment for their members. A perfect example is Chrysler Corporation, which almost went bankrupt because of outsized wage settlements in previous years. Government employees increase their budgets and staff to inflate their salaries at the long-term price of huge government deficits, inflation, and economic recession. I'm convinced that most of our economic problems in society come from expecting people in government to act in our best interests when they're put into office. When the entire governmental system says that the bigger your area of responsibility, the higher your budget, the greater the number of staff you have, the more you get paid. So when push comes to shove, the government servant, by basic human nature, will opt to increase the size of his department in order to increase the size of his rewards. The pull of the E factor is very strong. It causes the vast majority of men and women to indulge themselves at whim, to ignore the secondary long-term consequences of their actions, and by refusing to delay gratification, to engage in short-term pain for long-term gain. They condemn themselves to lives of frustration and disappointment. The E factor explains most failure in adult life. 
Only those rare few men and women, less than 5% in each generation, who consciously master themselves and resist the gravitational pull of the E factor, ever really succeed in the long term. The one human quality that must be developed for success is self-discipline. The willpower to force yourself to do what you know you should do when you should do it, whether you like it or not, whether you feel like it or not. A famous study spanning 12 years concluded that successful people are simply those who make a habit of doing what unsuccessful people don't like to do. And what are the things that unsuccessful people don't like to do? They're the same things that successful people don't like to do, but successful people do it because they know that that is the price of success. It has been said that hard work, persistence, and focusing on clear specific goals are the keys to success. That's true, but these are merely the outer expressions of self-discipline in action. Your key to success in life is to resolve to do what you know you should do, what other successful, self-disciplined people do, when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. True self-esteem, the foundation quality of your success, comes from mastering yourself, resisting the temptation to take the fastest and easiest way, sticking to what you know to be right, until you win through. This is the psychology, the mindset of success. Self-esteem requires self-discipline, and self-discipline builds self-esteem. Well, what have we learned? The first thing that we've learned, number one, is that failure is as predictable as success. You must be aware of what failures do and don't do it. And since the great majority of men and women are going nowhere with their lives, you must be very careful to observe in your environment people who are going nowhere and don't do what they do. Don't read what failures read. Don't watch what failures watch on television. Don't spend your time the way failures spend their time. Number two, success and failure are more the result of your habits than anything else. You must develop success habits and make them your masters. You must learn those success habits from other successful people whose achievements you admire. Number three, remember, and this is the key to understanding economics. It is the key to understanding marketing. It's the key to understanding why things go wrong in our society even with the best of intentions. And it is that everyone is naturally. That means by nature, lazy, greedy, ambitious, selfish, ignorant, and vain. Now, this is neither good nor bad. It's just a fact of life. It is only the way people demonstrate these qualities that makes them either good or bad. It is always the actions, not the qualities themselves. We know also, number four, that everyone wants the same things. You and I, we all want the same things, though often with different degrees of intensity. We all seek security, comfort, leisure, love, respect, and fulfillment. Number five, the natural human tendency is to seek the fastest and easiest way to get the things we want right now, with little or no concern for the long-term consequences of our actions. And the tendency to seek the fastest and easiest way almost invariably leads us to engage in actions that cause us to fail in the long term. Number six, the ability to discipline yourself to delay gratification in the short term in order to enjoy greater rewards in the long term is the indispensable prerequisite for success. And finally, number seven, when you develop the habit of self-discipline, you free yourself from the E factor. With self-discipline come the feelings of self-esteem, self-confidence, pride, and satisfaction that are the great treasures of the human experience. And one more point, one of the most important things I've ever learned, a philosophic point if you like, your values, your true beliefs, are always expressed and only expressed in your actions. It is not what you say and it is not what you intend, but what you do that signifies what you really believe. If you engage in the actions of successful people, if you practice the same principles and live by the same rules, you will eventually come to be exactly like them in your beliefs. We will look at the 10 vital principles of success, achievement, and peak performance. Living by these 10 principles will enable you to accomplish anything you really want in life. Your ability and willingness to discipline yourself to accept personal responsibility for your life is essential to happiness, health, success, achievement, and personal leadership. Accepting responsibility is one of the hardest of all disciplines, but without it, no success is possible. The failure to accept responsibility and the attempt to foist responsibility for things in your life that make you unhappy onto other people, institutions, and situations completely distorts cause and effect, 
undermines your character, weakens your resolve, and diminishes your humanity. It leads to making endless excuses, my grave revelation. When I was 21, I was living in a tiny apartment and working as a construction laborer. I had to get up at 5, um, so that I could take three buses to work in order to be there by 8. Um, I didn't get home until 7 p.m., tired out from carrying construction materials all day. I was making just enough money to get by and I had no car, almost no savings and just enough clothes for my needs. I had no radio or television. It was in the middle of a cold winter with a temperature at minus 35 degrees Fahrenheit, so I seldom went out in the evening. Instead, if I had enough energy, I sat in my small apartment at my little table in my kitchen nook and read. One evening, late at night, as I was sitting there by myself at the table, it suddenly dawned on me that this is my life. This life was not a rehearsal for something else. The game was on, and I was the main character, as in a play. It was like a flashbulb going off in my face. I looked at myself and around me at my small apartment, and I considered the fact that I had not graduated from high school. The only work that I was qualified to do was manual labor. I earned just enough money to pay my basic expenses, and I had very little left over at the end of the month. I suddenly knew that unless I changed, nothing else was going to change. No one else was going to do it for me. In reality, no one else really cared. I realized at that moment that from that day forward, I was completely responsible for my life and for everything that happened to me. I was responsible. I could no longer blame my situation on my difficult childhood or mistakes I had made in the past. I was in charge. I was in the driver's seat. This was my life, and if I didn't do something to change it, it would go on like this indefinitely by the simple force of inertia. This revelation changed my life. I was never the same again. From that moment on, I accepted more and more responsibility for everything in my life. I accepted responsibility for doing my job better than before, rather than doing only the minimum that was necessary to avoid getting fired. I accepted responsibility for my finances, my health, and especially my future. The very next day, I went down to a local bookstore at my lunch break and began the lifelong practice of buying books with information ideas and lessons that could help me. I dedicated my life to self-improvement, to continuous learning in every way possible. For the rest of my business life, right up to the present moment, whenever I wanted or needed to learn something to help me, I have returned to learning through reading, listening to audio programs, and attending courses and seminars. I found that you could learn anything you need to learn in order to accomplish any goal you set for yourself. Over time, I learned that fully 80% of the population never accepts complete responsibility for their lives. They continually complain, criticize, make excuses, and blame other people for things in their lives about which they're not happy. The consequences of this way of thinking, however, can be disastrous. They can sabotage all hopes for success and happiness later in life. From childhood to maturity, when you are growing up from an early age, you become conditioned to see yourself as not responsible for your life. This is normal and natural. When you're a child, your parents are in charge. They make all your decisions. They decide what food you will eat, what clothes you will wear, what toys you will play with, what home you will live in, what school you'll attend, and what activities you'll engage in during your spare time. Because you are young, innocent, and unknowing, you do what they want you to do. You have little choice or control. As you grow up, however, you begin to make more and more of your own decisions in each of these areas. But because of your early programming, you are conditioned unconsciously to feel that someone else is still responsible for your life, that there's still someone else out there who can or should take care of you. Most people grow up believing that if something goes wrong, someone else is responsible, someone else is to blame, someone else is guilty, someone else is the villain, and they are the victim. As a result, most people make more and more excuses for the things in their lives, past and present, that make them unhappy. Get over the mistakes your parents made. If your parents criticized you or got angry with you for mistakes you made when you were growing up, you began to unconsciously assume that somehow you were at fault. If your parents have punished you physically or emotionally for doing or not doing something that pleased or displeased them, you felt inferior and inadequate. When your parents withheld their love to punish you for not doing something they demanded, you might have grown up with deep feelings of guilt, unworthiness, and undeservingness. All these negative feelings could then intersect to make you feel like a victim. 
like you are not responsible for yourself or your life. Once you became an adult, the most common feeling that we have as adults, if we have been raised in a critical home environment, is the feeling that I'm not good enough. Because of this feeling, we compare ourselves unfavorably to others. We think that other people who seem to be happier or more confident are better than us. We develop feelings of inferiority. This could become an emotional trap. The fatal fallacy. If we think for any reason that other are better than us, we unconsciously assume that we must be worse than they are. If they are worth more than we are, we assume that we must be worth less. This feeling of inadequacy or worthlessness lies at the root of most personality problems in our lives, as well as most political and social problems in our world, both nationally and internationally. To escape from these feelings of guilt and worthlessness that have been instilled in us as a result of destructive criticism in childhood, we lash out at our world, other people, and situations in any part of our life with which we are unhappy or discontented. Our first reaction is to look around and ask who's to blame. Two religions teach the concept of sin, which states that whenever something goes wrong, someone is to blame, someone has done something bad, someone is guilty, someone must be punished. This whole idea of guilt and punishment leads to ever-increasing feelings of anger, resentment, and irresponsibility, an attitude of irresponsibility. Our courts today are clogged with thousands of people demanding redress and payment for something that went wrong in their lives, backed up by ambitious plaintiff lawyers. People go to court demanding compensation even if they themselves are completely at fault for what happened, especially if they are at fault. People don't want to accept responsibility. People spill hot coffee on themselves and sue the fast food restaurant that sold them the coffee in the first place. People get drunk and drive off the road and then turn around and sue the manufacturer of the 15-year-old car they were driving. People climb up on a stepladder and lean over too far, falling to the ground. They then sue the ladder manufacturer for their injury. In each case, people are attempting to escape responsibility for their own behaviors by blaming someone else, making excuses and then demanding compensation. Eliminating negative emotions, the common denominator of all people, is the desire to be happy. In its simplest terms, happiness arises from the absence of negative emotions. Where there are no negative emotions, all that is left is positive emotions. Therefore, the elimination of negative emotions is your great business in life. If you truly wish to be happy, there are dozens of negative emotions, although the most common are guilt, resentment, envy, jealousy, fear, and hostility. They all ultimately boil down to a feeling of anger directed either inward or outward. Anger is directed inwardly when you bottle it up rather than expressing it constructively to others. Anger is directed outwardly when you criticize or attack other people. Psychosomatic illness, negative emotions are the major causes of psychosomatic illness. This occurs when the mind, psycho, makes the body, some sick. Negative emotions especially as expressed in the form of anger, weaken your immune system and make you susceptible to colds, flu, and other diseases. Uncontrolled bursts of anger can actually bring about heart attacks, strokes, and nervous breakdowns. Here's the great discovery. All negative emotions, especially anger, depend for their very existence on your ability to blame someone or something else for something in your life that you're not happy about. It takes tremendous self-discipline to refrain from blaming others for our problems. It takes enormous self-control to refuse to make excuses. It takes tremendous self-discipline for you to accept complete responsibility for everything you are, everything you become, and everything that happens to you. Even if you are not directly responsible for something that happens like Hurricane Katrina, you are responsible for your responses, for what you do and say from that moment forward. It takes tremendous self-mastery for you to take complete control of your unconscious mind and deliberately choose to think positive, constructive thoughts that enhance your life and improve the quality of your relationships and results. But the payoff of this form of positive thinking is tremendous. Blaming is easy. By following the path of least resistance, the easiest and most mindless behavior of all is for a person to lash out and blame someone else anytime anything goes wrong, for any reason.
People who develop the habit of automatically blaming often become angry at things, blaming inanimate objects when they do not function as expected. It is so silly that it almost becomes a mild form of insanity. People become angry at doors that stick. They swear at tools that they are using. When they themselves make a mistake, they get mad when their car doesn't start. Even if it is an inanimate object, if it doesn't work perfectly, then the thing must be to blame. People will often kick a car that they are mad at, or a box that they tripped over the antidote to negative emotions. The fastest and most dependable way to eliminate negative emotions is to immediately say, I am responsible. Whenever something happens that triggers anger or a negative reaction of any kind, quickly neutralize the feelings of negativity by saying, I am responsible. The law of substitution says that you can substitute a positive thought for a negative one. Since your mind can only hold one thought at a time, when you deliberately choose the positive thought, I am responsible, you cancel out any other thought or emotion at that moment. It is not possible to accept responsibility and remain angry at the same time. It's not possible to accept responsibility and experience negative emotions. It's not possible to accept responsibility without becoming calm, clear, positive, and focused once more. As long as you are blaming someone else for something in your life that you don't like, you will remain a mental child. You continue to see yourself as small and helpless, like a victim. You continue to lash out. However, when you begin to accept responsibility for everything that happens to you, you transform yourself into a mental adult. You will see yourself as being in charge of your own life and no longer a victim. In Alcoholics Anonymous, people who are having problems with drinking attend meetings with others going through the same situation. What they have found is that until the individual accepts responsibility for his or her problems, both the alcohol and in other areas of life, no progress is possible. But after the person accepts responsibility, everything is possible. This is true with almost every difficult situation in life in which you project your unhappiness onto other people or factors outside yourself, money and emotions. Many of our biggest problems and concerns in life have to do with money, earning it, spending it, investing it, and especially losing it. As a result, many of our negative emotions are associated with money in some way. However, the fact is that you are responsible for your financial life you choose. You decide you're in charge. You cannot blame your financial problems or situation on other people. You are in the driver's seat. So it is only when you accept responsibility for your income who chose to accept the job you were working at, your bills who spent the money to put you into debt, and your investments who made those decisions. Can you move from becoming an economic child to an economic adult responsibility and control? There's a direct relationship between the acceptance of responsibility and the amount of personal control you feel you have over your life. This means that the more you accept responsibility, the greater sense of control you experience. There's also a direct relationship between the amount of control you feel you have and how positive you feel. The more you feel that you have a high sense of control in the important areas of your life, the more positive and happy you are in everything you do. When you accept responsibility, you feel strong, powerful, and purposeful. Accepting responsibility eliminates the negative emotions that rob you of happiness and contentment in every situation. The antidote to negative emotions is to say, I am responsible. Then look into the situation to find the reasons why you are responsible for what happened or for what is going on. Your intelligence is like a double-edged sword. It can cut in either direction. You can use your intelligence to rationalize, justify, and blame other people for things you're not happy about, or you can use your intelligence to find reasons why you are responsible for what happened and then take action to solve the problem or resolve the situation. You can make excuses or you can make progress. You choose. Even if an accident has occurred, such as your car being damaged in the parking lot while you're at work, you may not be legally at fault for the accident, but you are still responsible for your responses for how you behave as a result of what happened. Never complain, never explain the mark of the leader. The truly superior person is that he or she accepts complete responsibility for the situation. It's not possible to imagine a true leader who whines and complains rather than taking action when problems and difficulties arise. This sense of responsibility is the mark of a highly developed personality.
You take responsibility for your life by resolving in advance that you will not become upset or angry over something that you cannot affect or change. Just as you do not become angry about the weather, you do not become angry over circumstances and situations over which you have no control. Furthermore, you especially do not allow yourself to be angry and unhappy in the present because of unhappy experiences or situations from the past. You say, what cannot be cured must be endured. It's amazing how many people are unhappy today because of a past event. Even something that happened many years ago. Each time they think of the negative experience, they become angry or depressed once more. The good news is that at any time you can stop thinking about, discussing, and rehashing the past. You can let it go and begin thinking instead about your goals and your unlimited future. As Helen Keller said, when you turn toward the sunshine, the shadows fall behind you. Any self-discipline, self-mastery, and self-control begin with taking responsibility for your emotions. You take charge of your emotions by accepting 100% responsibility for yourself and for your responses to everything that happens to you. You refuse to make excuses, complain, criticize, or blame other people for anything. Instead, you say, I am responsible, and then you take action of some kind. The only antidote is action. The only real antidote for anger or worry is purposeful action in the direction of your goals, which is the subject of the next chapter. Before you turn to that, however, resolve today to first take complete control of your thoughts, feelings and actions, and then to get so busy working on things that are important to you that you don't have time to think about or express negative emotions to or about anyone for any reason. When you exert your self-discipline and willpower in the acceptance of personal responsibility for your life, you take complete control of your thoughts and feelings. By doing so, you become a much more effective, happy and positive person in everything you do.